your glory for our good in Jesus name Judges chapter 11 beginning at verse number 1 it reads like this from the English Standard Version now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior but he was the son of a prostitute Gilead was the father of Jephthah and Gilead's wife also bore him sons and when his wife's sons grew up they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. After a time, the Amorites made war against Israel, and when the Amorites, excuse me, Ammonites, that's very important that I make that distinction. When the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob, the person that they had just driven out. And then they said to Jephthah, come and be our leader that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, that is why we have turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be witness between us if we do not do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all this, his words before the Lord at Mizpah. Jump down to verse number 29. Then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will give me, excuse me, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. Verse number 34. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, my father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Now that the Lord has avenged on you, your enemies, on the Ammonites. That's a crazy place to stop reading, but that's where we're going to stop right now. So y'all have a seat and do know that the word of the Lord is blessed. Amen. So now y'all know why I need y'all to pray for me, right? The Lord just gave me revelation while we were reading, and I need to make note of this. Thank you. I would like to title our message, our sermon from this passage on this morning. I would like to title it, Faith for Complicated Times. Faith for Complicated Times. We started this series, Faith Factor, um, a few weeks ago, and we first talked about faith for troubled times, and then Pastor Tanya, she led us to talk about faith for your call, and then we talked about with Gideon, faith, um, well, both were for Gideon, faith for your call and faith for your victory, and this week we move on to Judges, um, in Judges to the story of Jephthah. Now, the way that we got into this is there's a passage in Hebrews in the Hall of Fame of Hebrews um, in Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about all these great heroes of the faith. And towards the end, it talks about um, Barak and Gideon and Jephthah and Samson. And it even talks about David and, and Samuel and talks about how there's not enough time to talk about how God used them by faith, by their faith 
God used them. And it even says at the end of chapter 11 that these were those, everybody listening in Hebrews, those faith hall of fame, those in the faith hall of fame, our faith heroes, God used them and they were commended for their faith. They were commended for their faith. So this morning we, we approach this passage with Jephthah and we, we are going to talk about, Lord willing, faith for complicated times. May your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. May your choices reflect your hopes and not your fears. That is a quote by Nelson Mandela. It is at least attributed to him. He was the great visionary leader and he, the president of South Africa after apartheid was abolished. And when I came across this quote by Nelson Mandela, I was struck because it prompted me to reflect on when I had the opportunity to visit Robin Allen. Robin Allen is off of the coast of Cape Town, South Africa. Robin Allen is where Nelson Mandela, in a prison there on Robin Allen, he spent close to 27 years in that prison on Robin Allen. And I had the opportunity to visit that prison. And I was even able to visit his cell, his cell that was no bigger than this carpet right here. He spent close to 27 years confined in a cell like this. The cell, I was struck that it had, um, it had bars on the window. And even though it has window panes in it now, when Nelson Mandela was in prison in that cell, there were no window panes there, just the bars. And Cape Town, South Africa is rather south. It's, some people say on a, on a clear day, if you stand at the tip of Cape Town, South Africa, you might be able to see Antarctica. And so there are penguins that live in that region. It gets cold there in the wintertime. And they were not only confined to that cell where the inclement weather could come at any time, and it was inclement weather, but they also were only able to wear shorts and a short sleeve shirt. And when you looked in the cell, they showed what he would sleep on. It was a thin mat, maybe this thick. And that's all he had to sleep on, confined to this prison for 27 years. I was struck when I came across this quote, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears, because I can't imagine how Nelson Mandela was able to remain hopeful in those conditions. How for that long, close to 27 years, he made choices and decisions that were not driven by despair not driven by the deplorable conditions that he was living in, but he made choices and decisions that were driven by the hope he believed was possible. It's so admirable and exemplary how in the midst of his deplorable and dark conditions, he would strategize. Literally, he would meet with other what was called political prisoners who were in prison simply because they were opposing apartheid in South Africa. He would meet with them in private and sneak to try to strategize and to try to come up with a way for them to overturn apartheid in South Africa. He would work on this and they would work that when they believed it would be overturned, how they would respond when they rose to power. How? In all of that, in those conditions that were so dark, so deplorable, was he be able to be driven not by despair, but to be driven by hope that his choices, that his decisions were driven by hope. I'm struck by it because I know how unusual and uncanny that is. Because our tendency as humans and even as Christians during times when life is disorienting and when life is discouraging and when life is complicated and we really are left confused and we don't know which way to turn, our natural tendency as humans, even as Christians, Christians is to turn to things that do not reflect what we hope in. Not only that, but we often, often do things 
that do not reflect who we hope in and who we say we have faith in. If you were able to take a high level view of our lives, just a cursory view on the surface of our lives, I believe that we would be hard pressed to see evidence of how faith in the Lord factors into our lives. There are probably few indicators that we are trusting and relying on the Lord and that faith in the Lord is actually factoring into the decisions we make. There's probably little to no evidence of us stepping out on faith, trusting and relying on what the Lord can do. I believe oftentimes our decisions, our choices, and our actions, they are driven more by our fears and our worries and our despair than our faith in the Lord. But this morning, I didn't come to bring bad news to you. I came to bring the good news of the gospel. I did not come to bring news of despair. I didn't come to condemn you. I came to lift us out of despair. I came to lift us up out of our hopelessness. I came to to help us fight against faithlessness and in the name of Jesus to encourage us to faithfulness in the Lord. I want to help us to fight against faithlessness and encourage us in faithfulness in the Lord. Indeed, this morning, I declare over us what God put in my spirit last night, Hebrews 10, 38 and 39, which says that the just shall live by faith. And we will not, I declare and decree it over us this morning, that we will not be those who shrink back and are destroyed. We will be those who have faith and are saved in the name of Jesus. We will not be those who who are weak back, limp back, jelly back Christians. No. We will be those who walk by faith because the righteous shall live by faith. And I declare this over us in the name of Jesus. Yea, God. There was a study done by a UCLA professor named Dr. Robert LaHaye, or LaHey, I don't know, L-E-A-H-Y. I know some of you want to Google it and fact check me, so you can go ahead. The study was called The Worry Cure. In this study, LaHaye, or LaHaye, or LaHaye, or however you say it, brought, he brought a group of subjects together and asked them to do one thing. He said, I want you to list all the things that you are worried about all the things that you are worrying about that might occur in your life over the next upcoming month. And I want you to list it in as great detail as possible. He wanted them to list everything from um, health concerns, money problems, relationship issues, all the stuff that we deal with, career concerns. He wanted them to write out everything that they had even an ounce of concern about happening over the next month. And then he told them to leave and simply come back after the month had completed. Here's what happened after they came back. They found that 85% of the things people cited as having worried about never happened. 85% of the stuff that they wrote down, that they were worrying about, fretting about, anxious about, never happened. Now, I know that some of you in the room are Debbie Debbie Downers, and so you're thinking, well, what about the 15% that did? Well, here's what you need to know about the 15% that did. The 15% that did have something occur. Of those, 79% were either not, either it did not go as bad as they thought it would go, or they were actually appreciative of those events occurring because of what they learned from it. So the math means that 97% of the things that they were worried about either never happened or they were not as bad as they thought that they would be. While this is a lesson in our natural life 
about why we should not let our fears drive our choices and not let what we're worrying about shape and factor into what we spend our time, effort, and energy on. Don't forget what Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6. He says to us, can any one of you add one moment to his life span by worrying? Then why do you worry? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. And if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you? And Jesus ends that phrase by saying, O ye of little faith. Do you know that too often we fret and worry and spend our time trying to figure out what God has already worked out? Jesus would later on say, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll be able to tell this mountain, mountain, move from here to there, and it will move because nothing will be impossible for you if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. This was in the same book, Gospel of Matthew, and it lets us know that when Jesus said, Earlier in Matthew chapter 6, O ye of little faith, it wasn't about the size of our faith. Because later on he would say, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. It wasn't about the size of your faith. Because he was trying to say to them, you really don't have any faith. Because if you have the faith of a mustard seed that size, you can do anything. Nothing will be impossible for you. And so here is what we get from that. It is that it's not about the size of our faith, but rather it's about the object of our faith. It's not about who or what you're, it's, excuse me, it is about who or what you're placing your faith in. Who are you placing your faith in? It's about the object of your faith. And this actually helps, del- helps us delve into our passage this morning. I know it took me a long way to get there, but I needed to go that way. Because if there's one thing our passage is aiming to get us to take away, it's that we should be encouraged to continually, enduringly, and faithfully put our faith in the one who is faithful. That's what this passage is is tailored to teach us. It's tailored to teach us that we, where did I do that? We need to be encouraged to continually, enduringly, and faithfully put our faith in the one and the only one who is faithful. 2 Timothy 3.10 says this, that even when we are faithful, faithless, God remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. Here's something I think is important for us to notice in this account, and we've got to get our arms around a lot of text this morning, so y'all got to bear with me, okay? But one thing that we need to notice about this account, uh, this account that is important is that although on the surface, at a quick glance, even as I was reading, you may not see it may not seem there is much faith in this passage. It may not seem that there's a lot of demonstration of someone trusting the Lord and putting faith in the Lord. And even as as I was studying this passage and I was reading commentaries, so many people came down on Jephthah and were talking about all the things that he did that that he should not have done and and how it it doesn't appear that he's trusting and leaning on the Lord. But here's what Hebrews tells us about Jephthah. Hebrews tells us that Jephthah was commended for his faith. And so even though it may not appear that there's a lot of faith in this passage, there's actually faith littered throughout this passage. Here's what you need to know about this account. If there's one thing you can say about Jephthah's account is that it is a complex, confusing, and complicated account. It is complex, it is confusing, and it is complicated. Not unlike many of our lives. Our lives are often complex, are often confusing, and are often complicated. We could all spend some time coming up with 
excuses or reason why things are, and I can't fully explain it to you because there's this variable and then there's this factor, and I know I did this, and I know they did this, but I know I was guilty in this area because that's how life is. It's complicated. But I think that that's why this passage can actually be very helpful for us because faith in the Lord is critical when life gets complicated. Faith in the Lord is critical when life gets complicated. This passage, I believe, helps us to think through how faith should factor into our lives. And the first thing that I think that it helps us to see how faith should factor into our lives is that we should learn to place faith in the one who is faithful. I said that already, but I want to say it again. That's the first point. We need to learn to place faith in the one who is faithful. Jephthah's story seems to start in chapter 11. But actually, this is just when we learn about Jephthah. Because what we need to all acknowledge, and I know we all know, is that our story actually never starts with us. There's always a backstory to our story. There's always something that has led to who we are. There is always some past. And you need not forget that, even young people, to know that there are people who have come before you. And so this story, even though it seems it begins at chapter 11, it actually begins in chapter 10, verse 6. And listen to what it says. Chapter 10, verse 6. The people of Israel did again Excuse me, the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Here it is again. (laughs) That the people of Israel are in this cycle of doing what they knew they should not have done in the sight of the Lord. Repenting to the Lord and then the Lord having mercy on them and then the Lord delivering them. And then they find themselves in the same predicament all over again. And here they are, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. But y'all, this time is different because before they were, if you look at some of the other accounts, you could see that they started indulging in idolatry. They would begin to worship other idols, other false gods. They would give their affection and their allegiance to these other gods, hoping that these other gods would provide something for them. And so this passage says that they serve Baals, And the Ashtoreth. They also served the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. See, what we need to see here is that the children of Israel, it got worse for them. Because before they were just serving maybe one or two other idols, but here they are serving seven other idols. And here's what I want you to know is that this is actually the first indicator of faith in this passage. Because they were placing faith in these gods that these gods would provide something for them that they thought they weren't getting from Yahweh, the God. And what we need to understand is in our lives, we often can have misdirected faith. That's why I said it's so important that we understand about the object of our faith. We have to understand who we need to place our faith in because they had faith. And guess what? You have faith. It's the question of what or who are you putting your faith into. It's illustrated this way. Tim Keller talks about the illustration that if there's a person who falls off a cliff and there is a branch next to them as they're falling, And they are trying to determine whether or not they reach out and grab that branch. It doesn't matter how strong their faith is in that branch. It's about whether or not that branch can hold them. And whether or not they will reach out to try whether or not that branch will hold them. It is not about how much faith they have. It is about how strong that branch is if it would hold them. Because a person with strong faith, if they don't reach out and grab that branch... They're going to die anyway. But a person with weak faith, they look at that branch, they say, I don't know if it's going to hold me, but I need to reach out and grab it anyway. They will find out that the branch, like the Lord, is actually able to hold you up. And so it's about the object of your faith. We, I want us to really get this. We all have faith. We all put our hopes into something. 
we all try to get stuff satisfied and stuff fixed and stuff figured out in something. But what this passage teaches is that we need to put our faith in the one who is faithful. What happens with the children of Israel is that they are now seven idols in. And it gives the picture that they tried one idol and that didn't work. So they had to try two idols and that didn't work. Then they had to try three idols and that didn't work. So they start and they try a fourth idol and a fifth idol. And do you see how it just begins to compound on one another? Because you can search all over and you will never find anybody like the Lord. And so here's what happens. Here's what happens. Verse number 10. It says, and the, and the people of Israel cried out to the Lord saying, we have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and have served the bells. They finally realized all that other trying did not work. I want somebody to understand and to figure out and to really, really assess in your life. What areas am I placing my faith into something else when I really should be placing my faith into God? Because too often, instead of the Lord being our first choice, he's our last resort. We come to God because we know he'll always be there after we've tried everything else. And that's the caution in this passage. It is that no one will be faithful to you like the Lord. And you can try to search, but you need to know that only the Lord is the one that can deliver. Only the Lord is the one that can provide. Only the Lord is the one that can heal. Only the Lord will always be there and will never leave you or forsake you. So get this, y'all. They come to the Lord finally. He's their last resort. But the Lord knows they've been doing this over and over again. And so verse 11, and the Lord said to the people, did I not save you already from the Egyptians? Here it is, is that it's the picture as he goes down. He says the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Moanites. He said they all oppressed you and you cried out to me and I saved you out of their hand. Here, here's the picture, y'all. It is that the gods of those kingdoms, you served them. And then as you served them, you found out that they weren't any good for you. And you came back to me and I delivered you from that. And I delivered you over and over again. I saved you over and over again. I was there for you over and over again. Verse 13, yet you have forsaken me and served under God still. And here's what God says. Therefore, I will save you no longer. He says, go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen, and let me see if they'll save you. See, we know, and it is true, that there is no place that we can outrun God's hand of mercy in our life. But some of us, we, are too, we, we trifle over God's mercy. And we keep going out and trying other things when God is saying, if you would just be faithful to the one who has been faithful to you, if you would look back over your life and you would see seven times fold that I was the one that brought you through all those other times, you tried that and you came back to me and guess what? I delivered. God is saying, if you would just get that through your thick skull, I will be there for you. But many of us, we can't get that. And, and that's why this passage is so important. And that's why even though I know judges keep saying that the people of, of Israel did again what was even the sight of the Lord, and we keep talking about that, we need to keep talking about it because many of us find ourselves again in the same cycle. And all along, we found that God to be faithful. And here's what God says to them. You go to them and see if they'll save you. It's as if God is saying to them, I'm going to let you have what you want. If there's anything scarier, it's when God releases you to be bound by the idols that you serve. 
it is scary for God to release you and say, go ahead and indulge in that and see how that works for you. And you become enslaved to that thing that doesn't work and doesn't bring satisfaction and fulfillment. Lord, help me move along. So here it is, is that God says, I didn't had enough. And I do believe that we can never outrun God's hand of mercy, but we do know that there is coming a day. Jesus is coming back, and he's going to see who has kept their faith in me and not put their faith in idols. Who has dis decided and looked back over their life and recognized God has been there for me over and over again. These idols, i got to say this, these idols, they were the idols of the culture. They were the idols of society. Here it is, is that it made sense to them to do what everyone else was doing. Because they thought if I do what everybody else is doing, I'll get what everybody else is getting. And many times we go after stuff. We make idols of things that is not biblical. It's simply the influences of our culture. And that's why we got to be careful about the stuff and the people we listen to. I got to, I'm, I'm a pastor, so I got to just press in on this. But some of y'all have been believing that it doesn't matter if you come to church. That I can be a Christian and not come to church. Here's the thing about that. There's no Bible for that. The Bible, it instructs us and urges us, and it says it is imperative that we gather together with other believers. So when we hear that, we know that that is a lie from the enemy that is trying to keep us from our faithful endurance in the Lord. Because the passage, the passage in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, where it says, do not forsake the assembly together of believers, it is the same passage that I just read from earlier that says that we need to be those who do not shrink back. We need to have confidence in God. And one of the ways that we get confidence in God is by joining together with other believers and not forsaking the assembly of the saints. Don't believe that lie. And if you hear somebody else say it, you need to tell them that's not true. That is an idol of the world. So we need to know that there's a day that coming that God is going to come back and you're not going to have no more time left. Choose today. I would rather you make the choice to bow down than to have to force to be bowed down one day. So God says, let them save you. And the people of Israel, verse 15, said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. Verse 16 says, so they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And it was then that God became impatient over the misery of Israel. God said, I know y'all are for real now because you've put away those idols. It was like Pastor Tanya preached a couple of weeks ago about Gideon tearing down those Asherah poles. It was the idea of removing the idols in their life saying, I'm getting rid of this, and I'm turning holy and devoted to the Lord. They used to have these idols in their homes, and it was actually the picture, the image of burning those idols and getting rid of them out of their homes. And it was when they did that that the Lord had mercy on them. And so we learn to place faith in the one who is faithful. We learn that we can place faith in him, because those other things not only don't work, but he has revealed himself to be the one who is faithful. Seven times fold, he was their deliverer. So that's the first thing that we see. The second thing that we see, I got to move on, is that we learn to let your faith factor into how the Lord uses you. We learn to let your faith factor into how the Lord uses you. So first of all, we learn to place faith in the one who is faithful. But second of all, we learn to let our faith factor into how the Lord will use you. Chapter 11, verse 1, we pick up with Jephthah. Y'all pray for me that I move quickly, all right? <clears throat> now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. So here's what happens is that um, Gilead's wife, who also had some other sons, <clears throat> her sons, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are a son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. But then, as you heard me read, when they are in trouble, they know that Jephthah is a mighty warrior. Actually, 
um, put the King James Version up real quick, uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 1. King James Version, we, we hear this about Gideon, right? We hear that Gideon is a mighty warrior. But if y'all been in church a long time, I want y'all to see what, how the King James Version says. Now, Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor. Y'all know we talk about mighty men of valor, right? He was a mighty man of valor. But guess what? He had a little tinge to his background because he was the son of a harlot. And so they drove him out and they rejected him. They really drove him out. Yes, because he was the son of a prostitute, but really because they were greedy. They didn't want to share their inheritance with Jephthah. And so because he wasn't one of, one of them. And so they drove him out. But then as he's driven out, go down to um, in chapter 11, verse in the King, um, New King James, in verse number three. I want you all to see what happens. So, so um, verse, verse one again. Chapter 11, verse one. So get, uh, he was a mighty man of valor. Guess what, y'all? He was a gangster. Okay. He was a strong gangster, right? But go down to verse number, 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 number three, three, verse number three. Listen to what it says in the New King James Version. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob. And worthless men banded together with Jephthah, next slide, and went out raiding with him. Here's what happened is when they pushed Jephthah out and rejected him, he becomes not only a gangster, but a gangster. Literally. They, he, he gets worthless men to come around him. And he becomes, he becomes like a mafia boss. And he is able to lead these worthless fellows. And they went out raiding with him. That's why I want to read it from the New King James Version because it doesn't really pick it up in the English Standard Version. It's literally the idea that they were gangsters. They were going around, they really were pirates. They were going around raiding folks. And they rejected him. And here it is, he found belonging with gangsters. If that's not a word for us. We got to be careful about who we reject and who we drive away and who we say we don't like your background because they might find belonging in a place where they don't need to find belonging. That's what gang gangs do. They provide belonging for people who are looking for a place to belong. And church, myself included, y'all, we got to be careful the way we look at people. We got to be careful about the way that we talk to people. We got to be careful about the way we push people off. We got to be careful about how we offend people because we could be pushing away the very person God wants to use to deliver us. So, so Jephthah is out here and he's been rejected. He's a gangster. But, but then they know he's a gangster and he's a gangster. So they say, we're going to war. We need a gangster right now. So what they do, they go get Jephthah. And Jephthah you know he's a gangster and a gangster because what he begins to do is he begins to negotiate. He says to the elders of Gilead, elders, if y'all want me to come and fight for y'all, y'all going to have to make me head of y'all. And they're like, all right, we'll make, we'll make a vow before the Lord. We'll let you be head of us if you'll come fight for us. And, and, and so Jephthah had the faith to be used by God even when he had been rejected by men. See, this is, this is where we see faith factor into this passage, is that people, they don't give Jephthah this credit. They don't give Jephthah the credit that he was rejected by men, but he still knew who the Lord was, and he still knew that if you fight on the Lord's behalf, the Lord will come on your behalf. And so Jephthah said, even though I've been rejected by men, I will let the Lord still use me. And here's what I want somebody to get today. Is that you've been rejected. You've been pushed out. You've been pushed away. You've been overlooked. You've been talked about. You've been discarded. You've been, you have been so pushed away that you don't want to come to church no more. But I want to let you know, do not allow the enemy to keep you from the Lord using you. God has a plan for your life. Even if you rough around the edges. And I love this passage because God uses, God uses Jephthah. Having been what he has been through. And he has learned how to negotiate. And God uses Jephthah with all of the stuff that he went through for the glory of his kingdom. That's what God wants to do in your life. God can redeem all the crap that people took from you so that you can use it for the glory of the Lord. But you have to make up in your mind that I'm going to avail myself to the Lord. 
that I am going to avail myself to the causes of the kingdom, that I am going to avail myself to let the Lord use me because what I've been through, somebody's going to be blessed by. Oh, yes. What I've been through, somebody's going to hear my testimony and they're going to have a testimony because of what I've been through. Too many of us are sitting on our seats and we're not giving our testimonies and nobody can be delivered because we think I done been through too much. Guess what? Everybody's life is complicated. Everybody's life is complex. Everybody's life is confusing. But they need to hear your story of how God brought you through and maybe how God is bringing you through. Because, because of Jephthah, God uses him to use what he learned in the streets for the glory of the Lord. Come on. That's how God can redeem it. But many of us, we want to sit on what God has done for us. And I want somebody to hear this. You think that you don't look the part. It's better that you don't look the part because you can minister to and reach somebody that the person who does look the part can't. So we need you for the glory of God's kingdom. Don't allow the enemy for you to allow you to sit in your gift. God wants to use you in everything that you've been through. Jephthah has been rejected and he allows the Lord to use him for the glory of his kingdom. And here's the thing is that we need to know what happens next is that so they go get Jephthah. And they, um, they say, Jephthah, we're in trouble. Can you help us out? And so uh, Jephthah goes to the, um, to the Ammonites. Let me make sure I get that correct because they're Ammonites and then they're Amorites. Yeah. So he goes to the Ammonites. He goes to the Ammonites and he says, now, why are y'all coming against the children of Israel? Jephthah's like, why, why? he sends a message. Why are y'all coming against the children of Israel? And the Ammonites said, because y'all 300 years ago stole our land and we want our land back. Now, Jephthah is a negotiator. And here's what Jephthah says. He says, no, we didn't steal your land. And I, and I wish I, uh, I, had, I had time to, um, no, 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 it's, it's, it's five after 12. So look at, look at verse number 21. Here's what he says. Here's what he says. He says, the Lord of God of Israel gave Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel. He says, the reason why we have this land is because the Lord gave it into our ancestors' hands. We didn't take anything. As a matter of fact, here's what it really happened. Um, uh, and, 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 and Jephthah knows the story. He says, what happened was we were trying to get through this land, and we actually sent out word and say, can we just peaceably go through your land? Uh, I love, um, and you can read it in Numbers chapter uh, 18 uh, or so, 18, 19, 20. Read it on your own. This is what, and, and it says, we just want to walk up the king's highway. <laughs> and so they were just trying to pass through the land. They weren't going to take nothing. They weren't going to cause any fuss. They weren't going to cause any anger. But then Sihon, the king of that area, he said, no, uh, -uh you're not going to pass through my land. And they, they went to war against Israel. And then because they warred against Israel, the Lord showed up and fought on behalf of Israel and routed out Sihon and all his people. And so after the Lord did that, he said, no, y'all go ahead and grab all this stuff. Because they tried to come against the one who I am for, and that's what happened with the Lord. Oh, yeah. If you keep rolling with the Lord, he'll make sure that anybody try to come against you, uh-uh, uh-uh, I'm, 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 I'm going to take them out for you, and I'm going to give you all everything back today. All right. and so, and so, so here it is, is that 300 years later, he's trying to say y'all took that land for him. And it wasn't even the Ammonites land. It was the Amorites land. So he was trying to take claim to land that wasn't even his. And so Jephthah says, no, that's not how it went down. He gives another illustration about Balak and, um, and what, what, what Balak did. And, and here's, here's the thing, is that Jephthah was encouraged for the Lord to use him because he knew what the Lord had done. He knew that it was the Lord who had worked on behalf of Israel. It was the Lord who had delivered Israel. It was the Lord who allowed Israel to take out Sion and all his kingdom. It was the Lord who did that. It wasn't, it wasn't um, um, Israel's um, working. It was the Lord. That, and Jephthah said, if God did that before, surely he'll do it again. And he was encouraged by what the Lord had done. Listen, in your life, you need to remember what the Lord has done. Oftentimes, when we face obstacles, when we face things that make us feel like we're going to pull our hair out, 
When we face things that are so huge, we don't know how we're going to get over them. We need to remember about the last thing the Lord has done. Because it's that, it is that evidence of God's presence and God's faithfulness and what God did the last time that should encourage our faithfulness in him this time. I, I need to start doing this. Lady Key, make me do this. I need to start keeping a journal of the things that I've prayed for and God has answered. Because we need to remember what the Lord has done. I think we would spend more time walking by faith and asking God to use us if we would spend more time remembering what the Lord has done as opposed to putting our faith in other things that don't work anyway. All right, let me move on. So he is encouraged. Verse number 27 says, I therefore have not sinned against you. He's talking to the Ammonites. You do me wrong. By making war against me. The Lord, the judge, decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. See, he knew that the Lord was a righteous judge. That he would judge justly. The Lord knew who that land really belonged to. And the Lord knew what had happened before. And so Jephthah says, it's in the hands of the Lord. Verse number 29, the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. This is also what it says about Gideon. This is also what it says about the first, um, no, Gideon, Gideon. Gideon, who we talked about a couple of weeks ago. This is what it said about Gideon, that the hand of the, the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. But it also said this about um, Othenio, I believe it is, the, the second judge that we find in Judges. And it is the idea that God's hand was on his life to use him for God's glory. I want to encourage somebody again, the person who feels rejected, looked over, pushed out. You need to know that God's hand can be on your life yes. Yes. for the glory of his kingdom and for the good yes. of his people. Yes. Y'all, we need to stop writing off people. We need to stop driving people away. Because you don't know whose hand, Amen. excuse me, whose life God is going to put their hand on. Amen. And I am believing, Amen. I am praying that God would begin to raise up leaders who have been rejected, who have been pushed out, who have been overlooked. I'm praying that God would raise them up because they have something that they can use for the kingdom that nobody else does. I'm praying that God would do it. I'm believing that God is going to start raising up leaders. Leaders who people thought that there was nothing good about them. Leaders who people thought they done messed up too many times. Leaders who people thought they got a silly background. They can't be used by God. Leaders who people thought they weren't smart enough. Leaders who thought that they made too many mistakes. I'm believing that God will raise up some leaders. And that it will be evident it's not about what they can do. It's about what God can do through them. Yes, God. Truth be told, ain't none of us got it perfect, no way. So skip verse 31 for a second, 30 and 31 for a second. Look at verse 32. So Jephthah crossed over to the Amorites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hands. So the second thing that we learn is that we need to learn to let our faith factor into how the Lord will use us. But then we come to the, the real complicated part of this passage. Thankfully, I'm, I'm out of town, so I won't have to spend a lot of time on this. This is what you call a complicated passage. Oh <laughs> Matter of fact, um, um, the Jude 3 Project, they, they do these, these um, forms on complicated passages, problematic passages. This is a problematic passage. But in this passage, what happens is, is that Jephthah, in verse 30, he made a vow to the Lord, said, if you will... Give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So if you didn't hear earlier, uh, I, I don't have time to read it again, but the first person that comes out of his house after he comes back from winning the war is his daughter. And he decides to go through with his vow. The daughter says, would you give me about two months to wail over this? 
but you need to do what you vowed and promised the Lord to do. And here, let me, let me give you what we learned from this first before I dig in a little more. We need to learn to let faith factor in to the decisions that we make. We need to let faith factor in to the decisions that we make. See, Jephthah was, was commended for his faith, but Jephthah is not unlike other judges that we see. If you remember, if you know this, um, Pastor T, she didn't have time to get it to it, but, but Gideon, after Gideon um, has, has his great defeat, he, he uses this ephod and people start worshiping this ephod as opposed to worshiping God. See, see if we're not careful, God can use us. But if we, don't, if we don't remain faithful, we can begin to make decisions that are ill-advised, unnecessary, unconsulted, uncovered. And what this passage teaches us is that we have to be careful with how we treat God. We think that we got to do all this in order to get God's favor. There are some other occasions in scripture, preferably in a few weeks we'll get to one, where somebody makes a vow to the Lord, and it's a good vow. Um, Hannah gives a vow to the Lord, says, God, if you'll give me um, a son, he, she eventually has Samuel, that, that I will offer him to the Lord. But she's saying she's going to offer him to the service of the Lord. And so this, this, is, a, this, is, a, this is a hard thing to deal with. And, and even some of, the, um, some of my heroes in the faith, um, like Tony Evans, here's, here's how he tries to explain it. He says that... Um, he doesn't actually have to kill her, sacrifice her. He just offers her to the service of the Lord. And, and, I, and I, here's what I think we can learn from this passage. Um, Bill Curry is William Curtis, the pastor of Mount Eric Baptist Church. He says that when you get to a passage and you're not sure what, if there's two options of takeaways and you're not sure which one to take away, it's probably best that you take both of them away. And so it is the idea that you can offer to the Lord what you have decided and vowed to give to him. And that there is opportunity for us in our lives to commit whatever we're offering to him fully to the Lord. But, another, but this passage, it's, it's hard to explain it away, y'all. And this is why I love the Bible. This is why I love the Bible. Because if I were writing the Bible, I would have left this part out. Not only this part, but if you look down to chapter 12, he does some things out of pride as well. And I would have said, why include that stuff? Come on, we want to we lift up these heroes of faith. Why include this stuff? Because the Bible is not trying to just paint a picture of everything was being right with God's people. Because he knows that all of us mess up and all of us make mistakes. Even as horrific as this, we don't see God intervening and saying, don't kill this, this daughter. See, that's why we can know that the scriptures are reliable because they don't try to cover up stuff when it gets complicated. And we learn that there's some things that we can open our mouth and say that we don't need to say. Matter of fact, some people are in relationships because they made a vow when it was not consulted with anybody else. You didn't ask God. You didn't ask anybody who was covering you. And now you're all out here in a mess because of a decision that you made that was not consulted with. And many of us find ourselves in situations because we made a decision that was ill-advised. We did not ask anyone who was wise, who was a wise counselor. And we just out there on our own. He should not have opened his mouth to the Lord in this way. But what Judges also teaches us is that even though Jephthah didn't get it right, if you were to understand the Bible in, in, in chronolog chronologically, you will know that alongside Jephthah's story, in the background, something is happening. In the background, here's what's happening, is that there is another man who was born of a prostitute. That prostitute's name was Rahab. Rahab would give birth to a son whose name was um, Boaz. And Boaz would be the great grandfather of David. And if you don't know what happens with David's lineage, 
Jesus comes out of his lineage. And so what really is happening is judges are saying, this judge who got it wrong points to a judge who will get it right. Here is a judge born of a prostitute who got it wrong. There will be a judge born of Rahab, the prostitute is in his lineage, who will get it right. Here is a judge who will say, God, would you give me victory if I sacrifice my life, not my daughter's life? And this passage points us to Jesus. It lets us know that we all need Jesus. Even when our leaders fail us, even when our leaders make ill-advised mistakes, and they will, don't forsake serving Jesus. Put all your hope and trust in Jesus because he is the one who is faithful. He is the one who was and is and will be. He is the one who is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the one who at his name Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And so my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust. 